will be in John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. And this is uh, our series this Advent season is Advent's Gospel Message. And this title of the sermon is The Word Became Flesh. And so if you would, let's pray one more time and then we will read and worship God through the preaching of His Word. Bow with me. God, again, we thank you for today as we get to gather together. God, as we get to worship you, as we get to approach your throne through the blood of Jesus. God, may we, this season, may we understand what Christmas is really about. May we understand that it, the miracle of Christmas and how you sent your son to live the life we did not live in holiness, to die on the cross in our place, to take the wrath we so rightly deserve. But yet, God, through your grace, God, you have called us in through your work, through your sacrifice, through Jesus Christ, your son. May we worship him now. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I just, um, I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. I know I did. And if you're like me, you're probably still digesting that pie, you know. Um, and had a slice last night, actually. It was delicious. But this is a very special time. Uh, it's special because Thanksgiving is over. It's a time of a new season, and I think you know what I mean. Uh, Thanksgiving was over, and it's time for Christmas. Uh, Jax and I, after Thursday on Friday, we woke up and we decided, man, we want to. It's a nice day. I really don't have a whole lot to do. Let's go play some golf. And you know, we we're about to leave and have a great time. And, and then my wife's like, oh yeah, but don't forget. It's time to put up the tree. And so we got that tree down. We got that tree up. And so, and then we left. But it's also a special time. You know, if you turn on your TV, you kind of realize this, right? I mean, if you turn on the Hallmark channel, of course, there's nothing but movies regarding Christmas now because Thanksgiving is over. And, uh, and of course, it's all about miracles. And it's amazing because at this time of year, this is really when you start seeing the word miracle pop up on TV and on any other site, really. You see the miracle of 34th Street. You see the miracle on TV shows that uh, how relationships are that are broken. But now they all come back together and they work out uh, because it's Christmas time. You see the miracle of the Griswold family Christmas, right? Where everything went wrong. But somehow, it all worked out right. It's a miracle. And it's very interesting because at this time in our society, even sometimes, even the greatest skeptics get rid of their skepticism for about a week or two. And then, of course, it goes back to normal. And it's interesting because this idea of a miracle, it's, it's not wrong. It's, it's not wrong, it, it, but it's a trace of a memory in our society of what the true miracle is about. You see, it's, it's a miracle about which all other miracles hang on it. Christmas isn't just about miracles that we see on TV, but it's on which all other miracles hang and flow from. It's, it's about the greatest miracle. You might ask, what miracle is that? It's about the incarnation. Of Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus' birth. Now, I know some people, when we say those big words like incarnation, they think, oh my goodness, that's a big word. But what it means when we break it down, it means like we see the word in, which means in, and then carne, which means carnal or flesh. And when we talk about Jesus, it, it means God in the flesh. This is the greatest miracle. In Christianity, which all other miracles hang on. You see, it's the message of how Christ Jesus became flesh is so important for us to understand because this message and this miracle, again, is what hold the truth of Christianity all together and make all other miracles of Jesus and his life possible. 
But the flip side of the coin is if Jesus did not come in the flesh as God, then Christmas has no point and all of Christianity and its truths fall apart and there are no miracles possible in Jesus. You see, I read an article that was performed in 2015 and it asked the question, do you believe that Jesus is real or not real? And this study showed, and I don't know where they got their numbers, but it said 92% of people that they surveyed believe that Jesus was a real person. Many people, when they look at Jesus, they see him as a good teacher, maybe even a good person, maybe even someone that can teach his good morals to people. But when push comes to shove, and when you start questioning people on saving faith, that Jesus was God in the flesh, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a righteous life, that we are to follow that life and submit to it, and that he died on the cross and three days later was resurrected. When they start saying they believe that Jesus is real and then you start pushing the what salvation is and what it really truly means to believe in Jesus, what do people start doing? Uh, they start acting real squirrely, you know, they kind of get clammy on the inside a little bit, hands start to shake, and I just thought he was a good person, you know. They start getting itchy. You see, the reason why this is so important is because the articles of, of faith all hang upon this one question. Did Jesus come in the flesh? And if he did, then Christianity makes perfect sense. An infinite God of infinite value came in the flesh and performed miracles all to show that he is God in the flesh, all to show that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to heaven. It would make perfect sense then that he is the only way to God, and it would make perfect sense that he is the only way of salvation. It all hangs, did Jesus come in the flesh? If Christmas is true and Jesus came in the flesh, then all the blessings that Jesus gives will flow into our life if we believe and trust in him. But if Christmas is not true, then there's no possible way of miracles. The Bible is illogical. It makes no sense. It can't be true. And all Christianity falls together. This is of critical importance in your life. Is Jesus who he says he is? Did he come in the flesh? Is he truly fully man and fully God? Do we see Christmas as just some secular holiday that has a trace of goodness in it and it makes us feel good and we give gifts and we kind of expect them in return? Is that how we view Christmas or do we see it as the way the Bible sees it as the greatest miracle of all time, which blessings upon blessings flow from their their, their one piece which Christianity stands or falls. So today, I want us to have a crystal clear understanding of what the greatest miracle of all time is. And I want us also to see what comes from it, what blessings flow from the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Just meaning, how does it affect our life? But in order for us to see it, how it affects us, we have to see what it is. So let's turn to John Chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. And this is the Word of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because He was before me. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Amen. This, I mean, we could just close up and say that's good, right? 
what Grace said of scriptures. But this is the greatest miracle of all time is that Jesus Christ, the word of God, God himself became flesh and dwelt among us. That is the greatest miracle of all time. That should blow our minds. That should change our hearts. That should humble us because John is leaving zero doubt about who Jesus is. He's leaving zero doubt that God in heaven came in the flesh and this is the thesis. This is the main statement of the book of John right here. What John has built up to in chapter one and what John will launch into in his gospel account is based upon this set of scriptures. And he's going to show how Jesus's life points to the fact that God, who is fully man and fully God, came in the flesh and lived a life that we did not live. That he lived it righteous to God, died in our place, took our punishment, and gave us his righteousness, and resurrected three days later. This is the truth, John says, that this is grace. You see, John wrote these words here because he wanted us to be absolutely sure we understood what he was talking about. And so he uses the word in Greek, the word logos here. And he uses it very, very carefully because he doesn't want us to be confused. See, that is the problem today is that many people are confused about who Jesus is. That's the, literally the whole problem in the world, with the world, is they don't know who Jesus is. And there are many religions that think that God is just some spiritual force. You see, Eastern religions like Buddhism were believed to be founded in the 5th or 6th century BC. And their idea was that God was some impersonal force of nature, that if you had a touch with nature, or you had a, a full understanding of it, and that you became one with it, then you would be a self-proclaimed God like Buddha. I know that's very simplistic, but that's in a, in a roundabout way, that's what Buddhism is about, is that you would become one with this impersonal spiritual force. And so that was a religion, an Eastern religion at the time. But during this time also, there was a, this idea of Greek mythology, which had a different idea of gods that would, once they kind of got their uh, little itch that they needed to come down into mankind, they would come down and if you worshiped and served them enough and, or caught their attention or sacrificed to them, then you might have a relationship with one of them and a child would be born and they would be some type of demigod, some subservient of the gods. And then the deity would withdraw and we would be left with a subservient God. So those are kind of the ideas of what's going on around them. But is that what John means when he says the word became flesh? That Jesus was begotten, that he was born or made by God, that he is some type of subservient of God. You see, this is what a lot of Jehovah Witnesses believe, that there is a God, that he was born by God and therefore he is a, a subservient of God. And they get this idea because how they use the word and interpret the word logos. But is that what the miracle is? That Jesus was just some born God that's a subservient of God the Father? And the answer is no. The greatest miracle is that the God of creation, the eternal God, the beginning, was God, who came down and took on flesh. That is the greatest miracle. And that is what John 1 1 tells us. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, or the Word was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, these three little statements here that John gives us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This completely hems us in as to who Jesus is. We cannot go to any of the other religions to get an idea of, because first of all, in the beginning was the Word. The Word has no beginning. Do you see that? In the beginning was the Word. It didn't say in the beginning God, He made Him. It, he 
was there in the beginning. Do you see that? It gives us no way to go about this. Jesus was in the beginning with God. He has no beginning. In the beginning, the word already was. No one created the word because in the beginning, when things were getting created, there already was the word. Not only was the word beginningless, the word is a person. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. He was a person, a person without a beginning. He said that, and he goes on to say, then it says the word was God. It wasn't a little G God that was created by the father because there was never a time in which he was not. This isn't a person that's similar or takes just attributes like God. This is God, the second person of the Godhead in the Trinity. And John makes it really pointed again in verses 14, 15, and 17. He said, Jesus, the Word, the begotten. You see, this word begotten, it kind of throws a lot of people off. It usually means born. Some people, you know, they've read it and they said, oh, yeah, I see that this was the father and he was God from all eternity. And at one point in time, there was a place in which Jesus Christ, who was not then suddenly became into existence. But is that what he means? No. The word was begotten must be trying to get another point across to us then. What is it? Is that the Word became flesh. The God from the beginning took on flesh and He dwelt with us. This word dwelt means He tabernacled with us. He was fully God and fully man and dwelt with us. That's what it means when it uses the term begotten or became He became in the flesh. He became like you and I. And he dwelt with us on this planet. But yet this word was made of the same substance, the same nature, the same stuff that God the Father is made of. Jesus Christ believed that. So this Christmas, you're either going to crown him and see him as God, the king in the flesh. Or you're going to think he's crazy. It's one or the other. You see, because Jesus claimed to be God. So the question we have to ask ourselves, is Jesus really God? You see, Jesus is God because Jesus claimed to be God in his words. Take, for example, John 1030. He says, I and the Father are one. You see, we need only to look at the Jews' reactions to this statement as he was claiming to be God. And it's because of this very claim that they tried to stone him for this very same reason. And they said, you, a mere man, claim to be God in John 10, 33. You see, the Jews understood exactly what Jesus was claiming. He was claiming to be God. He says, I and the Father are one, of one nature, one essence. And he goes on to claim this in his own words in John 8, 58, when he says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, before Abraham was born, I am. Referencing back to Exodus, when Moses asked God, who should I say sent me? He says, tell them I am sent you. He is claiming to be one with God. Is Jesus God? Jesus claimed to be God in not only by his own words, but in deeds by forgiving people of their sins. Jesus Christ forgave people of all their sins. We see this over and over in his account. When something happened, he would say, I forgive you of your sins. Only God can do that. Let's say that Eric and I are playing music. And I mess up on the beat. 
And Eric says, gets very upset at me, punches me in the nose. My nose is bloody. I, the punchy, him, the puncher. But yet I can say, I forgive you, Eric, because your offense was against me. Now let's say someone comes up and Eric punches me in the nose again. And the person that comes up says, I forgive you of your sin. How can that happen? How can it happen? It can only happen if that offense was against him. Jesus came saying, I forgive you of your sins. He, Jesus claimed to be God in deeds by forgiving people of their sin. The next, is Jesus God? You see, even Jesus' followers, followers declared him to be God. As the Lord, as he went to the cross and died on the cross, and three days later resurrected, and he came to some of his disciples, and his disciples saw him and declared him to be God. And then here comes along Thomas, doubting Thomas. And they told Thomas, Jesus is alive. What did he say? I will not believe you unless I touch his wounds, his hands, and place my hands in his side. And so what happened later, Jesus came to his disciples again. He says, Thomas, touch here, touch here, touch you. Thomas did. And what did he say in John 20, 28? He says, my Lord and my God. Jesus' followers declared him to be God. And Titus tells us the same thing. As followers of Jesus, we are to constantly be waiting for our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. His followers declared him to be God. But also the angels declare him to be God. In Revelation, as John is seeing this, this revelation that's being revealed to him, and an angel comes down in Revelation 19.10. What happens? He falls down and starts worshiping him. And what does the angels tell him? He says, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Even the angels declare him to be God. And even God the Father declares Jesus to be God the Son. In Hebrews 1, 8, the father declares Jesus. He says, when he's talking about him in chapter 1, but about the son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. The father refers to Jesus as God, indicating that Jesus is God. Is Jesus God? Who do you declare him? Who do you declare him to be? You see, do you see him as perfect? Do you see him for who he is, that he commands the seas and the seas obey, that he can feed over 5,000 people with a Lunchable? Is he God to you? You see, when I was a kid, we used to go out and at, at the playground, it was really a terrible idea. And we had this game to see who could stare up at the sun the longest. It was a terrible idea. I think that's why my eyes are bad, to be honest with you. It was a really bad idea. But I, it, I was so fascinated with it, right? I'm like, here's this giant ball of fire in the sky. And I'm just up there looking at it like eyes wide open. And then I can't see anything for like minutes afterwards. But I was fascinated by it. But if you look up with your eyes, you, you really can't distinguish its features, right? But when you see it through a filter, and I love seeing these pictures of the sun, and you just see these balls of flames, just these fires, it just amazes me. You see, when we look at Jesus through our sinful human nature, we see things that, couldn't, that we couldn't believe, right? That Jesus did all these things. But when we take it in and we see it the way the Bible presents it, 
and we behold his glory, full of grace and truth. This is what we must conclude, that Christmas, that Jesus come in the flesh, is true. You see, this is what makes Christmas, Christmas. This is the greatest miracle. But what does this miracle bring? What blessings flow from it? What does it mean in your life? First, if Jesus Christ is God become flesh, if Christmas has a point, if Christmas is true, and by the way, you know, if we celebrate Christmas and we don't celebrate Christ, then it's kind of hypocritical, but regardless, what blessings does it bring to you? I got three things here. It brings a transformation to your life. He says in verse 16, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. What is Christ's fullness? What does it mean that he is full? And I, I, I put down Colossians 1, 19 through 20. I don't think it's up on the screen. But listen to this. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Do you see that? That is Christ's fullness. That in him, in his humanity, in his flesh, as he dwelt upon the earth, the fullness of God was in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, through his fullness, as he dwelt upon the earth and as he went to the cross, he reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or heaven. And how did he do it? By making peace at the cross, by taking the wrath of God in our place through his blood on the cross by becoming a sacrifice. And what this does is from that fullness, by accepting Jesus Christ, we have all received grace upon grace. And this is God's grace. This is grace that God's love meets his grace and it's coming down to sinners it is the ultimate of God's love communicated to us through Jesus Christ. And Christ, through his fullness, it's just overflowing. It's just grace upon grace. But what does this look like in a person that accepts Jesus? How does this grace transform your life? How does Christ's fullness of God transform your life? I have a quote here from R. Kent Hughes. It is amazing. Listen to this. He says, in the 17th century, a young boy was born into a Christian home. And for the first six years of his life, he heard the truths of the gospel and was dearly loved by his parents. Sadly, though his parents died, the orphan boy went to live with his relatives. He was mistreated. He was abused. He was ridiculed for his interest in Christ. The orphan couldn't tolerate that situation anymore. And though still a boy, he fled and joined the Royal Navy. And in the Navy, the boy's life went downhill like a spiral. He became known as a brawler. He was whipped many times. He participated in the keel hauling of some of his comrades. And finally, while he was still young, he deserted the Royal Navy and fled to Africa where he attached himself to a Portuguese slave trader. There his life reached its lowest point. There were times when he actually ate off the floor on his hands and knees. He escaped, then became attached to another slave trader as the first mate on his ship. But the young man's pattern of life had become desperately depraved. He stole the ship's whiskey and got so drunk that he fell overboard. He was close to drowning when one of his shipmates harpooned him and brought him back on board. And as a result, the young man had a huge scar in his side for the rest of his life. 
He could not get much lower. Finally, in the midst of a great storm off the coast of Scotland, after days of days of pumping water out of the boat, the young man began to reflect on verses he had heard as a boy, and he was marvelously converted. The new life he found is re reflected in these famous words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. The young man's name was John Newton. He became one of the greatest preachers of the 17th century, all because of God's amazing grace. Through Christ's fullness, you have grace upon grace that will transform your life. See, grace is a precious word. At one time, it meant charm and beauty. It's still combined with that, that it shows our unmerited favor, that we were once wretched, lost, tossed out to sea, but were marvelously saved by God's grace. You see, it doesn't matter who you are, your riches, your poorness, it doesn't matter what you have done or haven't done. The only thing that matters is the gospel, gospel message truth of Jesus Christ. You see, you might look at your life and might think you are the most wretched sinner that you don't measure up. And the gospel truth is that you don't. But it's through God's grace in Christ's fullness that you do. You might not think of yourself as a bad person, but as a good person. But the thing about it is, is that if you think that way, then you are a legalistic person. And when you do something that you're not supposed to do and you try to sweep it under the rug, you're still a sinner. And you've fallen from grace. But the gospel truth is, even though your life might not change drastically, you might still be a moral person, you don't measure up to Christ and His law. But it's through Christ that you do. You see, grace, when it enters our lives, we're able to breathe as we are created to. To breathe. And our social relationships will show difference. When the grace of God entered John's Newton life, he mature, and as he matured in Christ, he, he uh, was known actually for his marriage to his wife. And it became an example to all. In fact, one of the greatest aspects of his life was his ministry as he ch had a change in life. As he experienced grace, he started to enjoy the restoration of his life that it should have been like. You see, if we believe in Christ, and as we b have been reconciled to him through Jesus' blood, In Colossians 2.10, Paul goes on to say that we have been made complete. We have been made complete by the fullness of Christ and our lives will be transformed. Second thing is, is it brings a solution to your guilt. It brings a solution to your guilt. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see, the other blessing is not just the, the problem of or transformation, but it also brings a, pro, uh, a restoration to our guilt. And what this means is as we look to the law that's given through Moses, what does it show? The law showed that it was to, uh, in Romans 5, 20 and 21, the law came 
into existence to increase the trespasses. You might go, how is that good? Because it shows that we are sinners. It shows that we are sinners. And it shows that the only way that we are restored is through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The only way we are to deal with our guilt is through Jesus Christ. You see, this idea is because we don't, that we have this guilt, is that we don't center our lives on Him. You see, we're transgressors of the law is because the law shows that our life is not centered on Jesus Christ. That's what it means. We do not give him our all. He does not owe us something for something we have done. See, we don't give him what he owes. That's the crime. That's the rebellion. And that, that's what we should be punished for. You see, some of you have guilt in you. When you look at your life and your soul, you're not, you haven't been able to deal with that guilt. Whether whatever it is, whether it's in our marriage or something that we're not measuring up to, maybe it's a false guilt because it's things that friends have done to us or people, or it's maybe we haven't treated our parents the way we should, or maybe it's our past and that we've never been able to get rid of it. You see, maybe some of you have cheated in certain places. You violated the trust. You have betrayed things. Or maybe it just hasn't worked up in your life what you have expected your life to be. Maybe things haven't worked out. And you feel guilty because maybe you think God is punishing you for something you haven't done. You see, whatever it is, Paul says the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abound all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, through Jesus Christ, we have grace and truth for, to forgive us of our trespasses, to forgive us of our guilt. It brings a solution to your guilt. And lastly, it brings a blessing of joy because it brings you into a relationship with God. See, what flows from the miracle of Christ coming in the flesh is that now through Christ, we have a relationship with God. You see, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who's at the Father's side. He has made him known. You see, when we talk about joy, some of you don't believe he can bring joy. But the question is, where's our focus? How do we come to Christ? Are we willing to give him every part of our life? You see, one of the reasons why you're not willing to give him every part of your life is because you say, if I come to Christ, I might have to give up something. I might have to give up a relationship or I might have to give up this sinful practice or this part of my life that I know it's probably not right, but I take, I take my joy with it. I don't want to give it up. I'm afraid if I give up that joy, this earthly joy, and give my all to Christ. I'm afraid that I'll miss out, that I won't have joy. You see, a lot of people come to Jesus Christ and say, especially this time of year, I want to be a little bit more religious. 
When someone comes to you and says, I am God, like Jesus did, I created you, give me your whole life. And you say, well, I'd like to come to church a little bit more or a little bit more often. I'd like to be a little bit more religious. That's crazy. You see, one of the greatest things that we can have and one of the greatest blessings that we get from the miracle of Jesus Christ coming in the flesh is that we get a relationship with God. The invisible God became known through Him, Jesus Christ, so that we may have a relationship with God the Father. And we know that this will bring joy upon joy in our life. Because why? It brings eternal life. It brings a life and a relationship that only Jesus can give. It will bring joy in your life. It will promise you more joy than the sin in your life. If you trust and believe in him. You see, as we come this season. And we come and we saw Jesus, how he claimed and who he was, how he came in the flesh, how he said he is God, how every all the testimony that we see that he is God and we see what kind of blessings that he brings us. How do we respond? You're either this season going to crown him as king or you're going to think this person's crazy. You're either going to hate him or you're going to fall down on his feet and give him everything. Let's pray. Let's gracious Heavenly Father God. We thank you so much for this season. As we get to come and as we get to worship by seeing who Jesus is, as we get to come and we get to see the truth of what blessings he brings. God, I pray that we see Jesus for who he is. I pray that we would respond rightly, that we would fall down at his feet, that we would worship him as God, and that we would trust him as our Savior, knowing that it's through him that we are reconciled to the Father. It's through Him that we have joy, unimaginable joy that only He can provide. And God, I pray that we would not get drawn into this secular time where people worship through earthly ways, but God, that we would worship righteously, that we would worship as Christ, as King of our life. I pray this in Jesus' name.